Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Emily here with a special one-off podcast episode this week. We didn't want to interrupt the Plan Produce Profit series that's happening at the moment. And don't worry, your next installment will be getting sent out into the interwebs this Thursday as per normal. But this one is a special one. It's an interesting one that is less about how to become an advisor and more of a topical discussion about potentially one of the biggest stories in financial advice at the moment. As you scale your advice business, are you frustrated with the amount of compliance, paperwork, and staffing issues? Virtual Business Partners specializes in helping financial services firms in four areas, admin, power planning, bookkeeping, and marketing. Virtual Business Partners work with you to get your business offshore ready. This includes identifying what tasks need to be done locally and what functions can be managed offshore. Advisors find they can reduce back office costs by between 50 and 75% and significantly improve their task turnaround times. For more information, go to virtualbusinesspartners.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here. It's been a, a little while since I've hosted a, uh, a podcast and that's just because the other guys, um, you know, they're probably a bit smarter and more articulate than myself, but um, kind of interesting. Today we've got Terry McMaster and, uh, and the reason why we're interviewing Terry is because it's, it's, it's one of a couple of things. It's either the most important story in financial advice or one of the most important stories in financial advice right now or it's not and i and and i think it's a pretty uh (laughs) binary (laughs) binary situation we find ourselves in so i'll set the scene um you know when 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 dover was asked to close and i guess we'll even get into the specifics of that uh our, our XY advisor group sort of blew up, you know, there was 400 that were looking for a new home in 30 days. And, uh, and so we did what we could, but obviously everyone's very limited in a situation like that. And I think someone close to you who was a part of the group sort of was saying, you know, you should touch base with Terry, touch base with Terry. And, uh, and, you know, I was sort of reading some of your stuff online and, and I thought, well, this is very interesting. and. I spoke to a couple other people in the industry and they, they kind of said um, it's going to be hard for Terry to get his message out beyond his own sort of channel because everyone's scared. Everyone's scared of, of you know, attracting the ire of, of ASIC or attracting the, the ire of, you know, the, the, the big end of town. And, um, and I was sort of sitting there and going, well, we don't really get affected too much by either of those um, stakeholders. Uh, we really just deal with advisors. And the and what we've already spoken about, Terry, is uh, advisors were the, the ones to lose out the most here. So that's very topical for us. So we got in contact, asked you a bunch of questions, asked you a couple of um you know, kind of pointed questions as well, because I wanted to see sort of, you know, what your responses were to that. And, mate, you've come back with a lot of really rational, thought out, unemotional uh, answers. And I thought the risk to us, at, let's call it XY, with having this conversation is relatively low, right? We're, we're not here to take anyone's side. But I think we live in a world where you should be able to have your say. Um, now, ultimately, this is going to get judged in the court of law and, and you and Asika are, are at it um, at the moment. Uh, but what I'd like to do is sort of get, before we get into this, I want to get a little bit of a background on yourself, how experienced you were in advice, um, how did Dover Licensee come to be and how did it grow to the size that it was? 
Sure. Um, my background is um, I'm a lawyer and an accountant and have been for many, many years, too many years to recall, really. And my practice always had an interest in financial planning. Um, and in my early days, I was a, I was a member of Pricewaterhouse's Life Office Taxation and Superannuation Group. I was a superannuation lawyer. So quite naturally, when I was in my own practice, I found myself advising clients on life insurance, superannuation, investing, and so on, which I was interested in. Um, the 2004 Financial Services Reform Act came along. One could no longer rely on the incidental advice exception to include incidental advice on financial planning matters. Um, so I did my diploma, uh, turned around looking for an A for sell, and was shocked at what I found controlled by institutions, product oriented, extremely expensive. So I spoke to a friend of mine and said, can I just have a license from you? He was a one-man AFSL. Can I just have a license from you which allows me to advise my clients, you're responsible for my compliance, but you otherwise won't interfere in my practice. You won't tell me how to run my practice, but you will make sure, of course, that the compliance aspects are ticked off. Now that's Dover. That, that conversation led to Dover and the basic model never changed and that advisors were allowed to run their practices they saw fit, free of institutional bias and influence, no volume requirements, no product preferences, a very, very wide approved product list and incredibly important, Dover not benefiting financially from the decision of the advisor, the advice of the advisor so that we were um, truly independent and agnostic of the, of the advice that was being given by our advisors. And that reflected my own practice. I've, I've always been commission-free, so Dover 2 was actually a commission-free AFSL. Obviously, commissions were received. They were rebated in full without charge to the advisors. So, that, so it was a different model, um, and we were proud of that difference. Um, it was a unique difference. I think, for an AFSL of that size. And you, you asked about growth. Well, that's an attractive model to any advisor who doesn't fit the square box dictated by an institutional-owned AFSL. And there are many such advisors. So that's my uh, thoughts there. Yeah, no, thank you. And how long were you advising for? Or how long have you been advising for? Oh, well, it's hard to say because it sort of it was a way over time, but um, probably the equivalent of about 30 years. So. And, and uh, yesterday I went on to um, the bastion of health in the financial services industry, otherwise known as the comment section of the IFA. And uh, I, I, there, was a, there was a comment about you, um, and it was downvoted 50 times. 50. 50 <laughs> times. Was it a good or bad comment? <laughs> it was. It was essentially. Uh, it, was <laughs> it was essentially bring Terry back, and it got mm. downvoted fifty times. And so, and the reason the reason I bring this up is, why on earth are you so controversial, even as an individual in financial services? It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I really have no idea, but I, I would counsel you in your um, future wisdom accumulation process to sk- steer clear of, of comments by anonymous on the <laughs> IFA website. I'm not sure that they're very good, but if you notice, there is an old guy there called Old Risky. He's very good. Old Risky knows what he's talking about. Interesting. interesting. That's not, it's not you by any chance, is it? No, it's not. It's definitely <laughs> okay. not. He's very intelligent. He's, I hear he's good looking too. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's let's start getting into this a little bit because if I was, we obviously spoke on the phone beforehand, and I, I asked you a bunch of questions, and and if I was to lay out the timeline, it would be something along the lines of this: um, a few years ago, you've got your client protection policy. And you take it to ASIC and you say, uh, is this a problem? 
then they come back and say, no, it's not a problem to you, but internally they perceive a problem. Mm. So that fast forward to the Royal Commission, you're on the stand and they bring up a topic that you uh, had previously thought was uh, fine. And then the question becomes, uh, did, was there, was there a, a plan to talk to you uh, about something that they had previously signed off on uh, on purpose or is it just simply a case of back then when you gave it to them, it was fine at that stage, but then over time as, as rules and regulations changed, it, it became uh, no longer appropriate. So how is it, do you think, that, that this client protection policy ended up being the centrepiece of, of the conversation? I'm intrigued. I have two theories. Um, just to backtrack, though, on your comments, um, we asked for the audit in 2016, and then we voluntarily provided otherwise privileged legal documents to ASIC, which discussed the client protection policy. So we didn't say to ASIC, look, there's the client protection policy, what do you think about it? It was, why would we? We didn't, we, we didn't think there's any concerns. We weren't concerned by it. Um, but it was in the documents. And we now know that way back in 2016, the ASIC investigators decided that the two legal reports which we provided to ASIC were incompetent and that the client protection policy was misleading and deceptive. Um, but they didn't tell us. And that's terrible because we were acting in absolute good faith. We voluntarily provided otherwise privileged documents. And, um, you know, we were asking for feedback. Um, and first we were being told that a feedback wasn't possible, which is not true. It was a lie. And then when finally the feedback was provided, after I gave an undertaking to rectify any concerns, an undertaking, not I actually said I would under, I undertake to rectify any concerns you have. We were then provided with a list of three concerns which um, omitted the client protection policy, but probably worse, omitted what I'm calling the other egregious conduct because, you see, back in 2016, ASIC wanted to close Dover um, using extreme injunctions um, under the Corporations Act, uh, and in summary, it was all to do with my advice and the advice of Florence T, our CEO. And in summary, the ASIC records and report on those advices was faked. I, I mean that, as I say it, the investigating officers wrote in their report things that actually never happened in the advice. Um, I'll give you the example of Florence T's advice. She was approached by Katrina out of the blue, asked for execution-only advice based on an AMP policy. Um, Katrina needed 800000 of life insurance to satisfy a bank's requirements. She was shocked when her AMP advisor quoted her, in effect, commissions of $20,000 over a 10-year period, knowing that um, McMaster's my accounting practice uh, didn't accept commissions, she contacted us. Um, Flo helped her. She did her a favour, basically pro bono. Katrina was down on a luck and was having to stop work to look after two disabled parents and in some familial arrangement was buying the house off them. Um, so we did the insurance application for Katrina um, pro bonos. The only fee was a $280 handling fee based on our costs uh, to rebate the commissions. Um, and unbelievably, that was um, construed by ASIC as being um, the marketing of a superannuation premature release product 
that we Florence was not being wrung out of the blue. She was actively um, looking for people to whom she could market the scheme um, to allow them to get their superannuation prematurely. Um, absolutely disgraceful. The only explanations for it would be either in co- sheer and utter incompetence as a, an investigator or sheer and utter dishonesty as an investigator. There is no other explanation for it. Um, there were similar um, reports prepared in respect of me, um, and I could go on. Those reports were then used um, to justify, at the time, getting injunctions under Section um, 1101B of the Corporations Act and Sections 1324 of the Corporations Act to close Dover down. For some reason, ASIC didn't proceed on those recommendations. Um, and it appears um, that, you know, a major, if not the reason, the dominant reason, at least a major reason for um, ASIC's animosity towards Dover can be tracked back to these original faked reports um, prepared by two of ASIC's investigatory staff. It's as simple as that. Why did they do it? I have no idea. But um, the Royal Commission documents to which we've had access and the limited access we've had um, under Freedom of Information tells that story very clearly, very plainly, very obviously. My complaint about this to ASIC went in six months ago and to this day I still have not been advised of progress, Um, although I do know (coughs) from FOI that the complaint was given to the relevant staff in February and they're asked to not speak about it to anyone. Um, And it looks like, to be frank, that there's a massive cover-up. I'll be be that blunt. So does that help the background? Mate, uh, that's that's a huge huge thing. If if I was to sort of summarise what you're saying is there was, let's face it, like financial services is, especially financial planning, it's very difficult to understand. I think unless you're in there day in, day out, that there's a reason why, you know, like in accounting land, you've got your big four in banking, you've got your big four mm. in mortgages, you've got your mortgage choice, Aussie wizard, but no one has been able to create giant financial planning companies. And, and my interpretation of why that is, because it's so, because everyone's so different and you've got so much to think about. It's very hard to scale. Who knows that might happen in time uh, with technology, but to date, no one's been able to do it. And that's because uh, it's very hard to understand. So potentially, potentially what could have happened here is um, there was an attempt. And, And just to be clear, going to the example, I don't want to dive too much into this exact example, but, this premature access of uh, superannuation, are you referring to the $280? No, the, um, the commission rebates, not the 280 You oh. see the life paid out of the superannuation fund. Um, so the commissions were paid out of the superannuation fund. Understood, understood. And they were as a dollar amount to, the, uh, to Katrina. And was this person, this Ka- Katrina, was she a secret shopper from ASIC? I've got no idea. Uh, ha- have, you, have you had any contact with Katrina? Have you asked no, her? No, we actually haven't. We have her contact details. Um, obviously, we had contact with her at the time. We saw the AMP statement of advice. Uh, I'd be very surprised if she was a shadow shopper. I think it was quite genuine. The, the life insurance premiums were paid and the commissions were, in fact, rebated. Yeah. Just, just with someone being a shadow shopper. Interesting. So how did ASIC find out about Katrina and this, let's call it $20,000 rebated commission? How did that happen? They, well, we asked for an audit. So during the audit, they requisitioned files, and those files were included in the documents given to ASIC. The craziest thing here is for $280, wow. Like what, what a repercussion. Now, some of my 
you know, I, I've looked at advisors over the years and I have, I have a lot of experience now with speaking to advisors and asking how, how they run businesses. And um, I, for one month, and you won't find this information anywhere because I uh, definitely didn't include it in my LinkedIn, but for one month in my early days, I worked for a, a company which will remain unnamed, but they were doing everything they could to make as much money as possible and um, at, but just tick the boxes and make sure that it's legal and uh, and the crazy thing is that doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Let's call it the uh, mini storm financials, right? So leveraging leverage and, you know, commissions on the investments and all that. And then on the flip side, you've got a situation where your, your company made $280. And and because I got to say, like, it sounds unbelievable. It's, it sounds unbelievable. Right. And, And I'm saying this to you, like, are you sure you weren't making any other money than $280 because I, it just doesn't make sense. Like, let me give you an analogy for that particular transaction. Um, when I've used, think of a, a metal manufacturing company that does large scale metal manufacturing and a lady rocks up at the factory back door and says, my child's toy is broken. Can you fix it? You need to weld it. Now, obviously, it's not what they do, but they can fix it. That was a similar situation with Katrina. She knocked down our door and asked for help. And um, we weren't, it's not, we don't, we're not in the business of doing, of helping people like Katrina. That's not our target market or anything. We're, we're wholesale, we're financial, you know, a day for self. But obviously, we've got the facilities to, and the ability to help her. So we did. We did it pro bono. Now, in, in actuality, Flo didn't do any work. She flipped it to the lady in the um, Vietnam office yeah. and it probably would have been less than two hours' work of Vietnamese labour rates. Yeah. Um, and we did it to help her. She, yeah. she was down on her luck. Um, she was stopping work at age 55, didn't have much wealth. I think she, from memory she was earning $50,000 a year or so. So that $20,000 of commissions over 10 years is a big whack. Um, and uh, she heard probably from a doctor because our commission rebate scheme um, was run for our doctor clients. She probably heard about that through her doctor or similar and she contacted us and asked if we could do it for, without a commission. And we said, sure, we'll help you. Um, we did it as a favour. So I've got to ask the obvious question why didn't you just dial the commission down to zero? Because um, the cheapest way to get life insurance is fully commissioned with 100% rebate. When you dial down, life office actually claws a lot of the commission back to itself. Yeah. My God. Okay. So let's let's assume then that there's no um, other information there um, and you're being completely upfront. Sure it, 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 well, it sounds unbelievable. So in this situation, you've attracted the attention of, uh, of ASIC and as such, that's created a chain reaction, um, which ultimately led to uh, you being on the stand in the Royal Commission. Mate, just get everyone up to speed. Why were you on the stand in the Royal Commission in the first place? Well, no one's explained. Um, the, the, the example of Katrina is one example. There's also, um, to be frank, a worse example involving myself, um, which was even either more incompetent or more dishonest. Um, the, the other matter is the client protection policy. Um, the client protection policy is largely a notice under Section 917D of the Act, which you're allowed to give to a client. Um, it was literally suggested by FOS um, in a determination they made um, against Dover following a fraud. We'd actually helped the client um, make the complaint to FOS. 
And then um, because there was no notice under Section 917D, we were liable for the fraud committed by the um, departed um, China-bound China uh, advisor. Um, and so we, we took that on board and put it into our documents saying um, that if the advisor does something outside the scope of the authority, the AFSL is not responsible for it. And that worked very well because it meant we could control our advisors better. Remember, we checked every statement of advice three times. Now, how do you make sure the advisors put the statement of advice in for review? Um, the way we did it was, one, we, we married up each commission to an SOA. And if there's no SOA, there was no commission. And that was pretty effective. Another way we did it was to say um, to our advisors, we've given a notice under Section 917D, you can read it, we call it the Client Protection Policy. If you put the statement of advice in for review, we stand behind the statement of advice and we won't rely on the Section 917D notice. If you don't put it in, the um, we will rely on the Section 917D notice and you're liable, not us. Now, another topic has to be briefly discussed. The um, That is the inadequacy of AFSL insurance, particularly the absence of runoff cover. There is no runoff cover, which means for practical purposes, most clients are effectively underinsured, uninsured from the AFSL's point of view. What we did, we, we made sure an independent third-party lawyer firm reviewed every statement of advice. A big reason for doing that was to bring into play the lawyer's professional indemnity insurance, vastly superior, and it has perpetual runoff cover. So Dover clients are still insured now. If there is a breach of the best interest duty or similar, we would be able to, theoretically at least, claim against the insurer's insurance policy. So when the client protection policy did in fact protect clients, it protected clients by bringing into play the superior lawyer's insurance, giving them much more protection than other AFSL clients had. But and that's what I was not allowed to explain at the Royal Commission. When I started to explain that, I was cut short by Mr. McC Mr. Costello elegantly and eloquently calling me a liar and, um, you know, the rest is history. And I realised that I was being seriously set up. And, and, and but did you know that they were going to talk to you about the client protection policy on the stand? Like what, why were you on the stand to begin with? No, we were told by ASIC, um, let me, again, background. This is my own experience with the Royal Commission. They provide you with what they um, call a rubric. My rubric went for one page and said I'll be uh, questioned on three different topics. Um, so, of course, I, I rang the, the Attorney General's office um, and confirmed with the solicitors that that would be my topic, those three concerns. And I prepared a witness statement which went into the Royal Commission based on those three topics. And as it unfolded, 70% of my um, questions were not on the rubric. They were what lawyers call an ambush, including the client protection policy. So we were, by omission, in effect told that the client protection policy would not be discussed at the Royal Commission. We were told we were... Um, uh, up for other topics. It, it was uh, an ambush. Which, and, and we've joked already a couple of times, and I, it's great to see you've got a good sense of humour about it, but ultimately being the most famous part of it, you fainting yeah. in, in the box. <laughs> yeah, yeah this happened to me before. I half expected I was going to faint on the day, actually. Um, it was in my mind that it would happen, but in the situation, of extreme stress, I have found myself on the floor before. Yeah, um, well, hopefully it won't happen again. Well, 
so so we get to the point where you know that the the royal commission's over and then bam right all of a sudden turns up on the on the xy advisor facebook group dover is now getting shut in 30 days Mm -hmm. right needless to say huge huge shock uh i want you to talk to us about how that happened and then what what message was sent to market and then finally what your perception of what the message should have been um asic um after the royal commission um i contacted asic and um asked if we could have you know someone to talk to because ASIC would typically not talk to us um, and suggested that we have discussions regarding some sort of enforceable undertaking to satisfy whatever concerns they had. Those discussions seemed to be proceeding when out of the blue a roughly written email arrived saying that they would not be proceeding and then the next day um, a voluminous legal document um, arrived in effect, um, seriously threatening Dover with um, overnight closure uh, in the sense of its licence being cancelled or suspended on the 14th of June, one month or so from delivery date. Um, And that was terrifying because you could appreciate what would happen to advisors if... um, a licence was cancelled or suspended. It wouldn't matter. Suspension is effectively cancellation overnight. Um, you know, even just the complexities of grandfather commission streams where um, those on renewal, those because of the loss of continuity, um, the advisor may not be able to renew the commission stream on some products. Um, but, you know, advisors, uh, many had borrowed money to buy practices um, the debt would be still there, but their practice would have disappeared. Yes. So um, it was a terrifying proposition. Um, and we said to ASIC, well, look, can we discuss the option of an orderly closure? Um, and I was out of action by this time. There's the stress, had, to be frank, got to me. And lawyers and um, others from Dover were, took over the discussions. With that we went to a meeting on the 1st of June and in summary, um, where we had used the word option, it was made very clear, very quickly, very strongly um, and unequivocally that it wasn't an option, it had to happen. And at the meeting, um, ASIC said that Dover had to shut on the, um, the 8th of June, Friday the 8th of June. Um, now, that was scary. Um, and it was non-negotiable. Um, and the Dover crew sort of took time out and came up with the idea, well, what happens if we agree that no advice would be given from the 8th of June on um, and we would have, say, four months to find a new home for advisors? And you think that through, um, why would ASIC say no? There's no rational reason for ASIC to say no to that proposition. If um, Florence T's advice to Katrina was so dangerous that, um, you know, uh, Dover had to be shut down immediately um, and my advice to Dr Amit so dangerous that it had to be shut down immediately, what once we'd promised not to give advice, why, why could we have four years to close down? It made no difference to us. Um, in summary, um, it... It was um, agreed that um, the the closure period would be two months, which wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. Then after hands were shaken, the um, ASIC staff went and checked with their bosses who came back and then they came back and even though they were very embarrassed and apologetic, saying, we can't understand this, but our bosses have reduced it to just four weeks. Um, we now know that that was done literally 
so that ASIC could be seen on the front foot um, after being seen on the back foot so often at the Royal Commission. And senior ASIC executives recorded the fact that they were happy to be seen on the front foot. It was cruel, it was malicious, it was mindless, it was unnecessary. It caused a huge amount of financial and personal stress and damage to a lot of people. Now, during the final week before the announcement, um, we wrote to ASIC, you know, regarding what we'd be saying to advisors, and um, it was actually suggested in that letter that we would say that it was basically Dover's decision to close. ASIC wrote back very aggressively saying if that's the um, impression or your belief that it's your decision to close, you're wrong. Um, In effect, you have to shut. We're only doing this because it's the quickest way to shut you down and it has to happen this way on the 8th of June. Um, No no advice, all advice is off the register by the... um, well, I got the month on oh, no, 8th of June, then all advisors off the register by the 8th of July, as it happened. Uh, that was a terrifying letter again. And we um, then did as we were instructed by ASIC. We, we um, did what we were told at four o'clock on the Friday before the long weekend. We gave notice to the advisors, explained to them that under an arrangement with ASIC, this is what we've had to do. Um, and the real um, push came from ASIC came the next day when very senior ASIC executives instructed ASIC's media machine to instead say that it was my decision to shut ASIC. Um, and that became their creed repeated to numerous journalists throughout Australia at that weekend but also repeated, for example, to the AFA. Good on the AFA. They um, did the right thing by their members, our advisors, and they lobbied for for an extension of the 28-day period. They were approaching the government. They were approaching ASIC. And ASIC, a senior ASIC executive, rung Philip Kuhn at the AFA and said, look, nothing we can do to help you. Closing Dover was completely Terry McMaster's orchestration, her word, and um, therefore the 28-day is outside our control. Um, Members of the public complained, ex-employees of Dover, and they were told um, by very senior ASIC executives that it was 100% voluntary on my part that Dover close. Um, The ABC was told by a very senior ASIC um, executive um, when they wrote in September last year that um, there was a forced closure. The ABC was rung and told, no, it was completely Terry McMaster's idea to shut Dover. So the cordial, the ASIC cordial that everyone had to drink was falsely that um, it was my decision to shut Dover. That was deliberate on ASIC's part, they knew there would be a lot of bad press and they diverted the bad press to me um, and away from themselves. It was disgraceful behaviour. Not what you'd expect from a senior ASIC executive who regards misleading deceptive behaviour as being reprehensible and deserving of a ban order. Now... <clears throat> Obviously, that, and, and, and you mentioned it very quickly, it, it had a devastating impact on a bunch of advisors. Um, I just found out today that 16 advisors have actually taken their own life this year, um, which blows my mind. And, and, and I don't even want to think about, you know, how much of that's got to do with what we're discussing. Um, but... Uh, is there, I just want to dive into um, what, what you mentioned before about you, you say that ASIC were, wanted to, to shut you down and you say that, that it's because that uh, 
that they wanted to be seen on the front foot. And, and I guess this is where it gets a little bit interesting um, because uh, obviously we, we have uh, an authority and power to, to make sure that financial advice is run and run well. And I think they've got a, a, a somewhat difficult job to do. Um, and, and is it just as simple as, and, and, and excuse me when I use this, but this was the term that, and we've already spoken about this, but the term that was used with Dover, and I think we need to address this, is the concept of the, the licensee of last resort. Mm. Now, if, mm. I have, if I have heard of this, right, undoubtedly ASIC have heard of this, right? So mm. if, if I put myself in ASIC's position, I go, right, there's Dover. We can see a problem here from back in the day. We've got a couple of examples in the audit. We can see this client protection policy and we hear in the market that Dover is the, the licensee of last resort. Now, I know a couple of advisors who were in your, um, who were in your licensee. And I can tell you right now, they, are, they, they, they were not after the licensee of last resort, but this is anecdotal. These are advisors that I, uh, that I uh, respect and uh, two of them individually come to mind and they were um, in your licensee. Now, how, how did you, how, how did Dover pick up this, this, this saying of licensee of last result and how do you respond to something like that? I think when you're presented with an uninformed subjective opinion, the best rebuttal technique is to refer to informed objective facts. And the informed objective facts would include that in the 12 months to the 30th of June 2019, AFCA did not find one complaint uh, against Dover. There were actually about six made during the year. There were no determinations against Dover for that year. That's remarkable because um, ASIC put the boots in on the 12th of June last year with some pretty nasty media releases, in effect inviting Dover clients to get second opinions and to complain. Very few did. None of those complaints were successful at AFCA. During the same period, AFCA recorded an average of 6,000 complaints a year, a month, sorry, uh, more than 70,000 for the year. Wait, wait, 70,000 complaints per year and... AFCA recorded 70,000 complaints um, in the year ended 30th of June 2019. And Dover received six. And and there was even a media campaign to get those six. Yeah, yeah. So that's one objective fact. That's one objective fact. Right. The second objective fact is it's now public knowledge that um, despite best efforts, um, ASIC has had to acknowledge that 19,402 people who received the client protection policy, uh, none have claimed that they were misled or deceived, none have claimed have complained. Um, our feedback from the client protection policy was clients liked it. They understood what it was doing. They thought it was reasonable. Um, three... Um, and this is on our website until very recently, Um, in July 2018, two ASIC investigators finally thought that maybe they should touch base with FOS and ask about Dover's FOS record since inception. And they seemed both surprised and disappointed to learn a month after they were actively involved in closing Dover that Dover had um, a very low complaint rate and it only had 17 complaints to FOS in 12 years, and only two of those actually were above 50,000. One involved a fraud, which was out of our control. Um, so Dover, the proof of the Dover pudding was in the complaint rate. Um, Dover had virtually no complaints, and that was because we triple-checked every statement of advice. Now, I think that those facts, those three facts, crush the argument. But to help explain where the argument went from, um, for some people, um, 
Dover probably was an AFSL of final resort. They didn't want to leave once they got there, that's for sure. Um, the, the, they were advisors such as a disabled advisor who had communication difficulties, um, who wasn't wanted by his previous safer cell because he wasn't getting the required volume of product. Now, we didn't care about volume of product. It was, um, we were indifferent. In fact, in our model, the less volume, the better, because volume represented risk. Um, there were a, quite a large number of women who um, were in mum mode and were practising part-time who received, without us publicising it, half-price fare. So they only paid half the normal fee. Um, we didn't publicise it because we thought all the blokes would jump in and say, look, I'm looking after the kids too. And uh, so we went with a common-sense solution of quietly, quietly. Now, those women wouldn't have been able to practise otherwise. Um, we have uh, practitioners who specialised in Islamic advice who just weren't wanted because um, in Islamic investing, there's rules against usury or interest-bearing products. Um, whereas we um, believe that if the client was, was Muslim, then for the, the advice to be in that client's best interest, it had to be consistent with the Muslim, their Muslim faith. And that is actually correct at law. You, um, but they were in the too hard basket for other AFSLs. Um, so... There are a lot of accountants who um, were actually very inactive but just wanted to be able to discuss, um, you know, financial planning matters with their clients safely um, without giving advice but just be able to just have general discussions and be on the safe side, the occasional advice. So for those, those advisors, and there are a lot of them, it was, an, it was a, a place of last resort. But I'll, I'll say... Um, I would say that uh, the idea of the uh, AFSL of last resort as a negative description is refuted by the facts. Um, and if it's interpreted as a, as a positive description, I'll embrace it. It was a, 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 a last resort for many of the advisors. They loved it and didn't want to leave. Um. Do you think this is a case of Al Capone, you know, the FBI not being able to get him for what they perceive to be other slights, but rather on a technicality of tax evasion? Do, do you think that, that, that potentially the way that ASIC's looking at it is, look, there's all this stuff, there's all, you know, there's all this... What, what, however, you know, you, you want to interpret it. Um, but the only thing we've, we've got is concrete. The, the, the tax evasion, so to speak, is this client protection policy. Do you, do, you, do you think that there's an element of that in any way? I, um, I think it's much more sinister than that. Um, the, the facts show that... Um, ASIC wanted to shut Dover in 2016 um, based on the advice being given to clients by me um, and the advice being given to clients by Florence T. Um, now, that's late 2016, early 2017. At that time, um, talk of a Royal Commission was in the air. The chatter was building and um, the, the, the House of Reps had voted a few times against it already, from memory. But ASIC would have known it was coming. And uh, we, right through 2017, we constantly asked for feedback from ASIC. None was provided. It compares to the situation where ASIC, where, say, the AMP contacts ASIC, where senior ASIC executives fall over themselves to get there in mass, um, you know, within a day or two of the request. And that were the meetings when the AMP gave the falsified documents. Um, it's an amazing read, just how psychophantic the um, ASIC staff were. But we can't get a phone call returned. Um, looking back, the 
irresistible inference is that either it was a setup from 2000, late 2016 on, with the intention always being to have fun at the Royal Commission, or what you're saying that um, ASIC actually was not concerned about the um, client protection policy and uh, when it came up as an issue at the Royal Commission, they jumped on it to do um, to, and use as an excuse to shut down Dover. Now, the evidence is equivocal because, um, for example, ASIC has recently said in writing that in mid-June 2017, the client protection policy wasn't of concern to them. So work that out. Um, six months later, it was very serious and grounds for shutting down an A for sale, but in June 2017, it was not of concern to ASIC. Um, ASIC has also said publicly that um, the real reasons for closing Dover have not yet been disclosed. Um, so although publicly, um, you know, they went through a pretense of it being a client protection policy, the, um, the evidence there is equivocal to say the least and there's a lot of evidence to say that the real reason was um, to do with the faked reports dating back to 2016 um, regarding Florence T and me. Um, we'll find out eventually. I, I mean, ASIC is um, doing its best to block any um, disclosure of documents or other information, but they won't be able to block it forever. Um, and at that point, when it becomes unblocked, their years of blocking will become, you know, quite culpable and hard to explain. So you're in the middle of uh, a legal battle with ASIC at the mm. moment, that's correct? Yeah, I am. And we'll, do, do we expect to get some resolution to the answer to that question during this proceeding? No. No, the, 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 the first federal court case, um, which I've been careful not to talk about, was strictly to do with the question of liability, whether or not the um, caption and the first sentence of the 12-page document were likely to mislead and deceive. Right. And okay. So well, in, in, in that case, we we'll, were not able to produce anyone who was, in fact, misled or deceived. All right. So I just have I'll hold, hold the comments on that there. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that, mate. Um, so then the, really um, the, the last question, the last topic I want to broach is um, what does this mean for advisors moving forward um, and how and, and really the main focus for, for me is how do we ensure that this does not happen again because we've got, depending on your count, anywhere between twenty to 25,000 advisors, depending on your interpretation. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a, it's, it's a huge growing amount of private licensees. We're at about 2,300. We've still got a lot of advisors in the, in the Align, and then there's a small sort of area of large private, which is obviously what, what Dover was a part of and, and now Synchron. So my, I, I don't really think they're going to shut down at, at let's say, an AMP or, or something like that over them. Well, they've said they won't. They've actually, um, Daniel Crennan QC has actually said publicly that they won't shut down an institutional bank-owned AFSL. So as far as protection for advisors is concerned, that is rather good. Um, you've got this long, long tail of, you know, uh, small private licensees, which you know, can, I guess theoretically could could get taken down, but it's a lot of resources from ASIC to shut down a, a one-man band. So, so theoretically, there's a level of protection there. It, it almost seems what, what you're saying is that the danger zone is in these larger private licensees. And if that is the case, uh, how do we... And, and I'd, I would love to hear your opinion on this. Like, how do we make sure that this just never happens again? I, I don't know. Um, my advice to a younger advisor would be um, 
remember that the banks fund ASIC. It's, it's more than 300 million a year. That was the greatest undis- undiscussed conflict of interest at the Hain Royal Commission. No one seemed to bring it up for some strange reason. Um, and if you're in the um, ASIC bank distribution channel for bank products and A&P products, you, your hands are tied. You're not really an advisor. You're being required to move product. Um, it's not really a satisfying life. If you go outside the institutional mainstream, um, I would say diversify your practice so that the financial planning aspect of it is um, not not mission critical. Um, so it could be, for example, that you're an accountant as well as a financial planner. Um, it could be that you're a lawyer as well as a financial planner. Um, mortgage broking is very good. Um, property advocacy, um, I'm not talking flogging apartments, I'm talking genuine, um, you know, helping with people with homes is a, sympathetic occupation. Um, so so you're insulated. You know, you've got, um, you know, think of a, a big ship that's got some compartmentalised sections so that if one gets punctured, the ship doesn't sink. I, w- I wouldn't have my whole livelihood based on a financial planning practice. Um, it's, I think, under attack, Um and I can't help but reflect that um, post Hain Royal Commission, what has changed other than the position of the banks being strengthened, um, which is not unexpected. Oh, I, it, <clears throat> well, at least someone maybe not watching as closely as you were, but it was unexpected for me. I mean, after the Royal Commission, when all the bank stocks went up, uh, mm. I was, I just, it, it sort of blew my mind a little bit. Well, Think it through. They, they, one of the suggestions was to cut mortgage brokers' commissions, that is, um, move a big tranche of income from mortgage brokers to banks. Another ongoing recommendation is to cut back commissions. Well, that's, that's the big cost of operation for an institutional AFSL and a, deal group, and a, and a fund manager. So they, they, were, they were cutting, slashing the costs of the bigger operators. Um, there will be a move more to, you know, employee-style advisors um, whose hands are tied, um, I would diversify. If I was a younger person now, and luckily, actually, one of the lucky things for me is I actually was very diversified. Um, the closure of Dover's um, obviously was an economic hit, but it also it wasn't a fatal blow by any means. Um, I think you've got to put yourself in that position, practice what you preach, diversify your investments such that if one hits the rocks, the rest is, you know, still float and can sail on happily. And so you develop a different aspect of your business activity so that, you know, if um, some unexpected black swan event occurs, um, you know, you're, you and your family are safe from that event. That would be my advice. That's pretty good advice. Um, so just to wrap up, because uh, we're hitting that hour mark, um, Undoubtedly, 400 advice practices or advisors. Was it 400 advisors or advice practices? It was 410 individual advisors. Some right, of them, so there might have been two or three in one practice, sure. a lesser number of practices. Right. Um, a huge chunk, however you slice and dice it, of advisors were really, really thrown under the bus, um, which, which is what? I find, yeah, yeah, and um, and and thanks for sort of giving a, a solution. It's a pretty difficult solution, I, I'll say, but I think it's probably the smartest one. Um, and for yourself, you know, you, you've already spoken about how it's very stressful, and um, but thankfully, like you're in a position to be able to to move on. Um, I guess. Like the last thing I just want to wrap up is what has this been like? What has this journey been like for you? And what do you think is going to um, happen to financial advice moving forward? 
um, it's it, the actual sequence. This time last year, I was in a very bad place. It was um, an experience I never expected to have, and I hope I never have again. And I wish the best possible mental health to every person. Um, having come through it, as um, others have sometimes observed, you, you can feel that you know, you're enriched by the experience. It's, it's a, another aspect of living. Um, one positive is um, you, know, you learn who your friends are. And there are a huge number of them, very good friends. You learn who your family is, and that's even better. Not that I doubt of it. Um, and you, if you work out what's important to you, and it, it, that's enriching. For financial planners, the second part of your comment, um, repeat what I said before, just remembering that, um, you know, if you saw a client who was in the business and they got their income from only one source, you'd say that they're at risk. You must diversify your business activities such that um, either suddenly or over a period there is a change in financial planning to make it more difficult for you to practice, that you can um, migrate your activity to the other activity, if you know what I mean, away from financial planning um, over time and insulate yourself from those big changes which are happening at the moment. Um, and uh, that would that's my closing thought, I think, if we're at the hour. Yeah. Hope of some interest to you, Clayton. Oh, Terry, no, absolutely. I think it's going to be interesting to a whole, whole bunch of people. Thank you so much for coming on uh, and sharing. I'm sure there's going to be yeah, a, a huge amount of interest in, in this conversation. So I appreciate your time, mate, and uh, all the best for uh, moving forward, okay? Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers, mate.